is Mr. Dave Fridell, and he's going to be your tour guide. So if you'll like, follow the leader, yep. come, come on this way. We'll, we'll get you indoors before the rain starts back up. It was from 1976. I've been away from it for probably about uh, three, four years. I came back and I was just, I was uh, awe impressed because um, what was here when I had been doing tours four or five years ago, uh, there's now a new building on the other side. There's been track extensions, realignment, so a lot of improvements and a lot of work done. Now the Huckleberry Railroad as a narrow gauge railroad, uh, narrow gauge was an advantage for like logging and mining because you can do tighter radiuses. Uh, the roadbed was less costly, bridges were less costly. Uh, but as a narrow gauge, other than if you're doing logging or something, uh, anything that you want to bring in from another railroad, standard gauge railroad, you had to offload into another car or reload. So it was very inefficient. So narrow gauge railroads are basically gone. So when the Huckleberry uh, came into existence. This was a Pierre Marquette branch, Point Branch, and uh, so uh, initially, when they fired up the railroad, they just picked up one rail, and scooted it over to get to the three foot gauge, picking it from four foot eight and a half over the three foot. You can't really do that over bridges. Though. So uh, for the first number of years, uh, you would come down the uh, the railroad and you do this little Watusi over to get on over the bridge, and then you'd Watusi back. Uh, but that since then. Roadbed's been reworked, uh, rail's been realigned a number of times, and uh, I'll, we'll show you the work train when we get in here. You guys can have the next one. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Get you in the other side. Yeah. Hold on, hold on. This is the wood shop where they maintain the wooden coaches and a bunch of other custom woodwork for the parks in general. For instance, the big heavy timber frame works on the uh, sawmill drying shed, the sawmill roof, and that stuff is all done down in here. Now they just put a big addition on this side of it. And so they moved all the machinery over in there, which gives them both tracks where they can put four cars in here if they needed to. So they're still getting stuff. A lot of that isn't hooked up yet. This has been moved in there in the last week or so. Now, Huckleberry is a three-foot narrow gauge railroad. The rails are three feet apart. Most railroads everywhere you're going to see around the entire world are four feet eight and a half inches apart, called standard gauge because it's so common. But they built a lot of smaller railroads in the early days because it was a lot cheaper and faster to build a railroad from point A to point B through mountainous country with the smaller trains. Ridges were lighter, tunnels smaller, curves could be sharper, you just had more freedom of how to get there. But of course the little trains couldn't carry as much stuff. Now most of the three foot gauge railroads, even a couple of smaller ones than that, uh, were in the mining and logging areas. And after 20 years or so of service, they were mostly built in the early 1800s. By the 1930s, a lot of the timber had been cut and the mines had been mined out and a lot of them were having a lot of financial difficulties and starting to go out of business. Then World War II came along and everything, they needed more of everything during the war. So everything did well during the war. But immediately after World War II, most of the narrow gauge railroads went bankrupt and just shut down. And by definition, they were in mountainous, hard to get to areas. And so it was usually cost more money to drag the stuff out for scrap than it was worth, so they just walked off. Left the wooden cars sit there to rot and the locomotives just to sit there to rust away. And that happened for another 30, 40 years. Now, uh, there was not a lot of narrow gauge in this area. That's the one thing that's strange about Huckleberry. It doesn't cost you any more in relatively flat country to build standard gauge than narrow gauge. So almost everything is built standard gauge to start. So Huckleberry is not typical of what used to run in this area. 
the style of things and the vintage and whatnot is pretty good, but the trains are just a bit smaller than they would normally be. Okay, now let's head down this way. You can look at some of the work we've done and get the work that we've done. Not much has been done right away because we've got the whole machinery out of there. So this thing is going to be back on the side of the car. The coach number eight here. Number eight is our most historic coach, our oldest coach. It was built in 1875, so it's 150 plus years old. And it was built for the Northwestern Pacific Railroad out in California by the Kimball Car Company in San Francisco. It was brought in here along with the other Huckleberry things in the early to mid 1970s. And it went through the shop here and was completely rebuilt. It was a lot of rust when we got it. When the railroad retired it, it was dragged off into the uh, mountains out in California and used as a hunting lodge for a little while. The wheels were removed before that, and so when we got it as a rust there, rust, not rusted, but rotted out for a chunk of old car, it did not have any wheels under it at all and most of all the interior had been removed. There were a few small pieces of the interior left that were used as patterns to make duplicates. And they installed it was the most ornate car we've got. But unfortunately, being ornate, they didn't want to put it in service for years because it would cost a lot more to maintain the minor damage that occurs in service. So we kept it around the shops here. We took people through it so they could see the fancy interior and everything. But now they're short on cars, they need to increase their passenger capacity. So they've decided to put the car into service, and so they're in the process right now of rebuilding it. Now, even though the car body was restored many years ago here, uh, the underframe of structure was not, so they're working on that. You can see where they're working on new bolsters to support the trucks. It's just sitting on old freight car trucks right now. We can't run it with those. We've got to buy or make new narrow gauge passenger trucks, and they're not easy to find. And it's got to have all the brake equipment put underneath it. That's not there now. So they've got a lot of work to do on it. Also notice the end platforms and the steps have been removed so they can work on the coupler and the end of the frame that they're rebuilding. So it needs a lot of work yet. In the meantime, they've removed a lot of the fancy interior and put it in storage so they can reinstall it at some future date, maybe. But when it goes into service, it won't be nearly as fancy as it used to be before it was uh, sort of gutted out. Any questions? All right, all cold storage. It's really easy to hurry. Depends on the weather. Well, it's right now, it's not that bad. Yeah, it's this structure is between the wood shop and the locomotive shop. It's just a big pole barn that they use to store the wooden coaches during the four or five months of every year when the railroad is not in operation. It keeps the snow and the rain and stuff off of them. They built a new car shed next to the building on the north side that they can store the whole passenger train in now. And so they're not using that for this. It's become more just a junk area and a hardware store for railroad equipment. There's even some stuff in here, notice the wagon wheels. Again, they do some work in the shops here for parks and other things. For instance, the carousel horses and the gondolas for the Ferris wheel uh, were restored in that shop right there many years ago. Now, this is the start on our big locomotive restoration. We have two functional, more or less functional steam locomotives. Number 152, which is running on the train today, it was built in 1920 for the Alaska, not the Alaska Railroad, but Alaska Engineering Commission in the 1920s, 30s. And then after World War II, the government sold it off and it went through a bunch of places and we ended up with it. Our bigger locomotive is much older, built in 1903. It's about twice the size of the engine that's running today. And this is number 464 from the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad. Now, the federal law mandates that all steam locomotives have to be completely torn apart, inspected, and repaired every 15 years. And so this engine has reached its 15-year period. We got it in the 1980s 
from Knott's Berry Farm. They got it from the railroad when it was retired. And they fixed it up a little bit and got it running again, but it was much too big for their sharp curves. They couldn't really operate it properly. So they sold it to us. And we got it in here, we tore it all apart and fixed it up, put it in the service for 15 years. Then it had to come in here and get all torn apart and gone through again. Put it back in service again. It takes us four or five years to do a complete overhaul on the locomotive like this with our limited resources, both manpower and money wise. So it went back into service again, ran for another 15 years. Now it's in here for its third overhaul while here at Buckleberry. So this is the cab, obviously. This is almost all wood. That will go into the shop and be fixed up. This is not in bad shape. Obviously, there's some cracks and some splits here and there and some things that have come loose. So they'll have to do a rebuild on it. But I suspect most of what's here will continue to be here after it's been fixed up. Yeah, we'll bunch of these little flat guys around with all the stuff around the shop. Railroad parts, brakes, locomotive fire grates, brake shoes, just everything you can think of around here. Pipes and rods and tubes and all kinds of stuff. Uh, this is our little work car. It's a gasoline engine driving a hydraulic pump that's used to run what amounts to be jackhammers that are used both for driving spikes and also for tamping ballast, packing the gravel down underneath the ties. These big jacks, which are removable, uh, if you've got a low spot in the track that's settled, the ground is moved or something, you put the jack under the track, jack the track back up till it's level, then you pack ballast gravel underneath the ties to support it, and that's what you use the tampers for. Also, a little crane on here so you can pick things up and move around. This is the rest of our little work train. Here's another Dallas camper. Like a jack camper. Here's a track saw. An abrasive disc. We use it for cutting the rails and removing pieces of the rail. Next to it is a track drill. When you cut the rails until you put the ends back together, you want to splice them together. You use a couple of splice bars like those green things there. You clamp one on each side of the rail, you drill holes through the rail and put big bolts through there to hold it all in alignment. Well, this is the thing you use for drilling the hole through the rails. Bunch of chains and tongs for picking up sections of rail and carrying them around. Uh, little grand caboose. This is the same railroad as that locomotive that you just saw the cab for, down there near Grand Western. And this caboose doesn't exist. It's a figment of your imagination. It's not really there. The railroad officially scrapped this caboose and removed it from existence back sometime in the 50s. It, however, it had a somewhat different fate. The railroad was bankrupt at that time, as it often was. A judge had been placed in charge of it as a receiver to manage the railroad during its bankruptcy. And as part of his fee for services, he had this junk caboose hauled off to his house in Salt Lake City, Utah, and put in his backyard as a playhouse for his kids. Well, it was fixed up a little bit for that purpose, but eventually the judge grew older and passed away. The kids grew up and moved away. A new owner had the house. And have a rotted out caboose in his backyard that he didn't want. But we got word of it and sent a truck up to Utah and brought it back. Unfortunately, the exterior portions of the caboose were too badly deteriorated and rotted away to be salvaged. But the exterior had protected the interior. So a bunch of our volunteers decided to try to rebuild this and they started taking it apart. And they saved some of the woods so they used patterns to make new parts to match. And little by little, they ended up with a flat car with a whole stack of wood on to it. All the parts necessary to put the caboose back together. Then it didn't go anywhere for a while. For about 20 years, it sat around here in that condition. Until so just the railroad was not going to spend the money to restore it because it's not a revenue-producing piece of equipment. It only got to handle about six people, and that doesn't make enough money 
to pay for the operation and maintenance of it. So anyway, it sat around here for a while, and the volunteers decided, well, let's fix it up. Let's finish the job. So they went to work, and they made new parts for all the stuff that was rotted out, and they put it all back together again. Most of the interior is original. Almost 100% of the exterior that you're looking at are reproductions following the old parts. New roof, new cupola, new sides, new ends. All that was done, and the car body is essentially complete. The underframe still needs a lot of work, the brake gear needs a lot of work, and the trucks need to be rebuilt or replaced, one or the other. And so quite a bit needs to be done yet before it can be placed in service. But at least it's all back together and looking nice, almost like it did when it was built originally many, many years ago. Right now, it's being used as an office for the shop. There's some computers and plotters and things in there, and they use it for making uh, plans and blueprints for all the parts they need to make for new things or repair things, or programming for the machines and whatnot. So it's, a, it's an office full of all kinds of things that were never dreamed of when the caboose was built originally. Where routine maintenance is done. Cars are brought in here, brakes are adjusted, things are lubricated, minor leaks and things fixed. The locomotives will come in here at night and be checked underneath for all their brake equipment, make everything adjusted and lubricated properly. Right now we've got our two little locomotives, number 585 and 571 here. These are five-ton Plymouths that came from the U.S. government. They had a big ammunition depot in Baraboo, Wisconsin. And ammunition depots are very decentralized. They consist of a lot of little buildings quite a long ways apart. So if anything blows up, it doesn't take everything else with it. And those, all those little buildings over many, many acres were connected together by an extensive little three-foot narrow gauge railroad system. But when the government closed that, we got word of it, sent some people out with an auction as they got rid of it, and we bought one of the locomotives. Somebody else bought the other ones. There were a dozen or more of these little engines there originally. And a few years later, one of the other people that had bought one didn't need it anymore, and they sold it off third hand, and we bought that too. So we ended up with two of them now. One we bought originally, and one we got third hand. They're used for just shuttling things around inside the shop here, moving these cars around. They can tow the little work train behind it for out track maintenance and uh, whatever needs to be done. They're very handy, they're just like they're gasoline hydraulic locomotives. They're kind of like a giant garden tractor on railroad wheels. You just start them up and drive them off. And Big band saw, the milling machine. This is a computerized milling machine here. Well, this is the heavy repair bay where most of the serious maintenance gets done. If you want big equipment, you need big machinery to work on it. So we've got a large lathe, a vertical turret lathe, vertical and horizontal, but the milling machines, the radial drill press, and the big hydraulic press for squeezing wheels on and off of axles. Now, as I mentioned, these locomotives have to come in and be overhauled, and so this is number 464, starting its several year overhaul here to meet the federal requirements. The moment they've gutted the boiler out, one of the most serious things you have to do is ultrasound test the shell of the boiler all the way around on a fine grid, measure the thickness of it. And that has to be certain thicknesses in order to meet federal requirements for whatever the boiler pressure you're running is. So in order to do that, you've got to have somebody inside the boiler and somebody outside the boiler. Well, normally the boiler consists of the back end of the firebox, which you can see lighted here. Then you've got the main boiler inside, which is just a big cylinder full of water. But through that go a hundred or so pipes, boiler flues. And the hot gases in the firebox pass forward through all those flues, heating the water around them. And the gases end up in the front end in an area with no water called the smoke box. We'll see that in a minute. Now, in order to get inside the boiler, which is completely filled with those boiler flues, you have to take all those flues out. Well, that's been done now. So what you see in there with all the holes in it, that is the rear flue sheet. There's a matching sheet in the front up that smoke box that all the pipes go between. Well, they've all been removed so somebody can get inside there and work the interior part of that thickness testing. At the same time that's going on, they're starting to work on the running gear. This is 
the rearmost driver's set. The locomotive is a 282, a Mikado. It has two guiding wheels, eight driving wheels, and two trailing wheels. This is the rearmost of the driving wheels. That's been dropped out of the bottom of the locomotive and brought over the set here. This is the bearing block. That'll have to be removed and check the bearing surfaces, both the interior part of the bearing box and the axle portion itself, the journal. Make sure that's all up to snuff, repair anything that needs to be done. If you notice the wheel is slightly concave from wearing on the rail. That's not right. It should be a nice smooth slight taper. So the driver set will have to be put over in the big lathe and that wheel recontoured to the proper shape. Also, all the wheels then have to be the same size since they turn at the same speed. So whatever one is the smallest, they'll have to turn everybody else down to match it. So this is the crank that the side rod works on to turn the axle. The cab obviously sits up on here. You've seen that already. You can kind of look inside. There's the door where the coal is shoveled in. Fire just passed through all those flues. Now, most of the boiler is just a great big pipe, basically, with all those flues running through it. This is what they have to test the thickness of all over the place. The firebox is a little more complicated. It's double walled. There's an inner box and an outer box, and between them, the steam tries to pry them apart. So you've got, these are bolts that run from the inner box to the outer box and keep the sides from spreading. And they're all over the place, they're called stay bolts. Up in the curved portions up above, we have a different type of a stay bolt, because in the curved areas, as the boiler heats up and expands and contracts and the pressure changes inside, it has to move a little bit. And so these basically have a ball and socket joint on the end of them pretty nearly that allow just a little bit of motion as that expansion occurs. And so these are the flexible stay bolts, and they've all got to be checked, every one of them. It's normal in an expansion like this to find a few busted stay bolts, and you just have to replace them. What are all the shock circles? Uh, they're just checking stay bolts. These may be oh, okay. stay bolts that they haven't uh, <coughs> approved yet. I'm not quite sure what these are. But something was there that isn't there, but anyway. Uh, I'm not really sure exactly what's going on there, but a lot of these stay bolts are hollow. The drive the slot in the frame where the big driving box that you've just seen sits in there so they can move up and down, held in place by this big spring, so that supports the locomotive. As it moves down the track, that stuff all has to adjust and move up and down a little bit, and up is perfectly level. And so, in order to keep all the weight from being on one axle when it hits a high spot, all these drivers and wheels are connected together by an equalizing system, which you can see parts of here. So that as one driver is shoved up, the next one goes down to carry more weight and keep everything e equally loaded. The trailing truck, all four drivers, and the lead truck are all equalized together, so they all kind of move as a flexible unit as the engine runs down the track. Here's the main rod that propels the locomotive from the piston and the side rod that connects all the drivers together. The one section obviously has been removed because we've got the driver set out of there already. The valve gear controls the motion of the steam flow through the cylinder system. This is the cylinder, what's called the cylinder, but it's more than that really. It's actually two cylinders, one above the other. The steam from the boiler comes down through here into this upper chamber, and this is the valve. As the locomotive moves, these rods move back and forth, shoves the valve back and forth inside the housing here, and that controls the steam flow to the main cylinder down below that actually propels the locomotive. It pushes this big rod and pulls on it through the crosshead back to the rod and the crank that turns the wheels. Steam locomotives, unlike an automobile, steam locomotives are double active. The piston both pulls and pushes. So you get two power strokes per revolution of the driver and two cylinders, so you get a total of four power strokes per revolution as the engine moves down the track. Here's the smoke box, it's single walled, no water up here. All the hot gases, smoke, and cinders come through all those flues that are normally between all those holes, collect in this box. The exhaust steam from the lower pistons there 
moves through that big casting and comes up and blasts up through a nozzle that's normally on top, and that's why the plate that's in there. And that blast of steam going up the exhaust blows the smoke and cinders out the stack, and that's the chug, chug, chug that you hear when the engine is running.